All right, here we go. The Maxwell Briscoe years, wheels of fortune that drove Newcastle's growth economy and community involvement for nearly a century. Um, I worked there 37 years, my dad worked there 40, and my grandfather worked there several years back during the Maxwell time. So I have a long history with that building there in the background that unfortunately is no longer with us. So, okay, I gotta push down to go up, okay. This is me, that's self-explanatory as I just said. Um, I had the fortune to work with Charlie and Bill. Um, so uh, we'll just go on with this because the other night when we went to the library, it was supposed to be a 60 minute presentation and it ended up being 95 and we were all tired. So tonight we're gonna keep it to an hour until the cup showed up. Now, <laughs> yeah. All right, the year was 1900. Newcastle had a population of 3,406 people. General William Gross, a Civil War hero, died at the age of 87. Upon his death, what some of you may not know, this is where he lived. And upon his death, he donated this building and grounds to the Henry County Historical Society. So this is a Civil War general's home. Farms dominated the landscape. Hoosier kitchen cabinets were just starting to be made here because Hoosier Kitchen Cabinet actually started up in Albany, Indiana, but through a fire, which happened to a lot of people back then, a lot of plants, fire destroyed a lot of them, they had to move quick. They found down there where the brand new Dollar General is, for those of you at local, is where it was located. It was a former Speeder bicycle factory, and the automobile was coming on. They were phasing the bicycles out, and Hoosier needed a place to go. So down there they went, which commonly then was known as the box factory to most of us locals. There was not an automobile in sight. The movers and shakers of Newcastle put out a, a booklet called Newcastle the Beautiful, which was a vision of the future. I know the script down at the bottom is extremely hard to read. I did try to read some of it and uh, they were bragging about Newcastle having resources. They had plenty of water, they had plenty of free natural gas, and were luring factories into Newcastle at that point in time. I don't know if you can read it, but it says it's dated April 1907. But before we get there and we start talking about the automobile, Maxwell had a connection in Indiana before they came here. A guy by the name of Elwin Haynes up in Kokomo, Indiana in 1894 made the first actual automobile that wasn't converted from a buckboard or a wagon or anything. And he is credited by most automotive historians as being the father of the American automobile. And he actually built the car for sale and is the first recognized commercial automobile for sale in the United States. And in 1896, his business really took off and he wanted to make more and he needed a good old engineer to help him make more cars in a quantity. The engineer they sought out was Jonathan Maxwell. That's where he got his start in the automobile business. Shortly after that in 1896, when he got the Haynes Apperson Automobile Company up and going in Kokomo, he decided, well, I'm gonna go up to something else. I need a challenge. In comes a man named Ransom E. Oles, the father of the Oldsmobile. And Ransom E. Oles had an idea how to make the cars a little bit nicer, more plush, more comfortable, and make it look more like an automobile instead of a wagon. He designed the curved dash Oldsmobile. And in automotive circles, this car is uh, thought of as one of the first leaps and bound improvements and dependability in the automobile. And how he did that he employed an engineer named Jonathan Maxwell. So that was his second venture into the automobile factory. Well, after building everybody else's business up, he thought, why don't I make my own car? I've kind of figured out how to do this. So he needed money and he heard about this guy named Benjamin Briscoe. Benjamin Briscoe was the money behind a lot of automobiles 
Plus, him and his brother started a company that started a stamping business that made door hinges and common steel parts up to and including fenders because back then they had metalsmiths make fenders one at a time. Well, he developed in the, uh, uh, stamping dies and the presses that needed to make that. And so Briscoe was making them for every automobile company back at that time. Buick, uh, but the Stoddard Dayton, and many, many other uh, automobiles. So Briscoe kind of wanted to make a car with his name on it too. So he and Maxwell got together and said, hey, let's, uh, let's build us a car and we'll call it the Maxwell Briscoe. And they said, well, okay, if we're gonna do this, let's do it big or go home. So they designed a building in 1906 that at that time was going to be the largest automobile factory in the world. Even over Europe and all those, it was gonna be the biggest and it was. Their vision came true. There's a story going around here in Henry County about how that happened to be in Newcastle. I'll tell you the story, take it with a grain of salt because we cannot confirm it or deny it. They were actually coming to Muncie because of the Ball Brothers manufacturing had lured them to Muncie to bring the Maxwell Briscoe factory they had heard about to Muncie. But a guy by the name of Charlie Hernley, who was one of the fathers of the uh, Newcastle business with Charlie Ogborn and many others, he decided, you know, I don't think this is a good idea. So him and some of his cronies went up to the hotel where Maxwell and Briscoe were at, kind of maybe had a few drinks, maybe a few more drinks, and the next thing they know, they had him out to a place in the boondocks called the uh, Nip, and Tup Nip and Tuck Club out here in the boondocks, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But Charlie Hernley was one of the main reasons the Maxwell Briscoe factory got to Newcastle. Maybe not the most above board way, but he made it happen. Hurley also had a touch. He was uh, a factor in bringing the Hoosier kitchen cabinet to Newcastle. He also had a finger in the Corel French Piano Company. So Charlie Hernley, he also, oh, let's get to the Nip and Tuck first. The Nip and Tuck Club, Colonel Charles Nip opened the Nip and Tuck Country Club in 1899. There used to be a railroad line going through the north side of Newcastle. It went up through Moreland, went on through Lynn, and on over into Ohio. And it was out in the boondocks. Um, you'll see another picture of it, what's left of it. And I've been out there and walked it, and uh, yeah, it was uh, within a couple hundred yards of the railroad line. And it was very private. It was uh, for the elite, but that's the way it was back then. It wasn't anything really um, uh, to be ashamed of. And as you can see, some regarded as political suicide for the ambitious to ignore the summons of governors, senators, and congressmen obey. That's the Indianapolis Star. And uh, there was a lot of industry brought into Newcastle via the Nip and Tuck Club. And supposedly, through legend, they had the best fried chicken in this part of the world. So with a couple of good cold beers and a fried chicken dinner, we got the Maxwell plant and many others. I went in search of the Nip and Tuck Club about 10 years ago, and it is in a heavily wooded area. You can't hardly find it in the uh, summer, but on a warm January day, Mike Davis and I went out looking for this, and this is what we found. This is what is left of it. And uh, it's out by Hillsborough, for the locals that knows where Hillsborough is. It's a little burg just northeast of here, just a few miles. And it was quite, quite the place to be if you were an elite. And here is the actual picture of Maxwell and Briscoe at the Nip and Tuck Club on that fateful day, whatever that date was, we're not sure what the date was, but that sealed the deal, a chicken dinner and some good cold beer and friendship at the Nip and Tuck Club. Here you'll see some of the forefathers that were the real movers and shakers. There's Charlie Hernley, uh, Jennings of Jennings Lumber Company, Boyd, Jesse French, Piano Company I just mentioned, McIntyre, L.A. Jennings, more lumber guys, Walter Chambers, uh, the newspaper magnate, Cicero Bailey, Finance, William Elliott, Goodwin, and William C. Bond. 
and others. And then came the great day. This photo taken June 22, 1907 shows one of the most exciting days in Newcastle history as U.S. Vice President Charles Fairbanks came to help dedicate the Maxwell Briscoe Automobile Company, regarded then as the largest facility of its kind in the nation. It was remembered as the day they planted an automobile factory next to 2,500 farms. And for those of you that might not know where it is, it's right down 14th Street here, not quite a couple of miles. And uh, that was a big, big, huge deal, not only because the factory was the biggest at that time, but you can see how many people showed up and the factory wasn't even complete yet. When the factory was completed, now this says 1907, and I just now noticed that is not correct. The building is only two stories at that time. And I, I think 1907, they started, which we'll see here a little bit later, that they put the third story on it late in 1907. But before the building was even finished, they were making automobiles in the lower floors and pumping them out as fast as they could. There's the vice president. Um, to get a vice president, in a little burg like Newcastle must have been a, a great thing. Today, the even most, uh, whatever that word is, expectations of those interested in development of the Maxwell Briscoe Enterprise at Newcastle have been fulfilled. Not only is this facility the largest in the state, but it's considered to be the largest automobile factory in the United States and still growing. Among representatives of the American automobile industry, the Maxwell Briscoe Motor Company stands as a leader its Newcastle factory was an object lesson in well-directed and systematic effort, and there is no doubt that its product, the Maxwell car, will continue to lead the automobile industry in the country. And it was. The Maxwell is, was known to be a very dependable car. And down at the corner of 14th and I Avenue, some of you that are in this building may know where the old Cherrywood drugstore was or where the Porthole restaurant was. Well, that's where this picture was taken, right there on that corner, looking north back towards town. The Maxwell Briscoe building facts. The main building was 720 by 60 feet and stood three stories high in 1910. The original plan was to produce 20,000 automobiles per year, and they almost did that. And that is enormous back in those days, because 10 years earlier, there were no automobiles, and then all of a sudden, we're selling 20,000 just Maxwells. Buildings in the original building included lathes, drills, automatic nut and bolt machines, a riveting department, paint shop, upholstery, and sheet metal departments. I was fortunate enough to work in those departments in my work lifetime. I was a skilled tradesman before I went on the management side. Here you see it, it's still a two-story. And here, in 1909, we start the floor construction of the third floor. It was set up in a mass production assembly line. The body work was done in the third floor and about where the central part of the building is. Charlie Bill, where the old circle entrance, that's where the bodies come down and join the frame on the second floor. So this, this is a real nice picture. I happened to stumble across this on the internet. I'd never seen that picture. Maxwell is also not only a dependable car, but it's a pretty fast car. The engines were very fast. And locally, we used to have a huge fairgrounds out on the northeast side of town, out at 31st and Brown Road. And it had a one mile dirt track. They raced horses and earlier, in the late 19, uh, 1890s up to 19 aught, there were big bicycle races with the big front wheel, the speeders, and then the automobile uh, racing came about. Because I've been told for many years, because I'm a car guy and I've played with race cars all my life, people said, when was the first automobile race? It was when the second automobile was built. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the first race was. So here you see Mr. Tommy Costello. He was an engineer for Maxwell, and there he's testing a factory race car, probably getting ready for the 1911 Indianapolis 500, which Maxwell had cars in the 1911, 12, 13, and 14 Indianapolis 500. And they were driven by notable, like 
Barney Oldfield, who back then he was the A.J. Foyt of his day. And uh, a guy by the name of John Peed, whose father was one of the movers and shakers in Newcastle, also got to drove, uh, drive some of the Maxwell race cars. Buick would send their factory race cars down. American Standard would. Stoddard Dayton would come over. And this is where they raced before there was an Indianapolis 500. And Mr. Peed won the very first race driving a Maxwell here in Newcastle out at the fairgrounds. A visit to this immense plant is a marvel to all in sights seen which are not dreamed about in a mere pursuit of a description of the plant. All the mechanical departments are equipped in the most modern way. The most up-to-date machinery is at hand for the express purpose of turning out parts of automobiles that exact nicety even to the thousandth of an inch, which is you need those tolerances in your crankshaft and your connecting rods and things like that, wrist pins. Here are to be found lathes, drills, automatic nut and bolt machines which do their work human-like and need slight attention after being started, the riveting department, paint shop, upholstery, and sheet metal department, etc. Employing men who are highly skilled in their respective trades. Few industries employ such a wide variety of mechanics as the automobile industry and all receive good wages. That's debatable back then because um, just to your right, you'll find an old toolbox there. And that was donated to me by a personal friend of mine I went to high school with, Steve Sexton. That was his grandfather's machinist toolbox when he worked at the Maxwell. So we're very gifted to get that tonight. And now we'll talk about the cup here in a little bit. Also, another vice president visited. He wanted to know what all the commotion was about. And James S. Sherman came to town on October the 11th, 1911. Here he's in the 1500 block Indiana Avenue, which is near our library, if you want reference to where that is, showing a huge crowd waiting for Sherman to arrive at L.E. and W. Depot. And that old depot is still over there on the railroad track. Transportation, utility access, accelerated Maxwell Briscoe growth. Very few towns had three in urban lines, four railroad lines, gas and water, real estate available like Newcastle. All these factors helped the Maxwell Briscoe Automobile Factory accelerate to, touch an ex to such an extent the economic forecasters predicted Newcastle would be a city of 100,000 people at the turn of the 20th century. Well, we fell a little shy of that, for whatever reason. Also, besides being the biggest automobile factory, they had the largest hot forging plant in the United States. And a forging, it's uh, really difficult for me to explain in a few words, but a casting is when you have a mold and you pour liquid metal in it and that makes a part. A forging is when you have a nice strong piece of steel and you heat it to around 15 to 1800 degrees and just beat the crap out of it and form it and shape it like you would like to have your part made, which is much stronger. A casting will break under a sudden shock or a forging will not. A forging will bend, but they had to do that on the front suspension and the steering part because the roads back then were really, really bad. And if you hit a big pothole or an animal or whatever, you couldn't have something break and lose the steering. So that's why forgings came about. And the die sinking department were the people that made the dies that Bill Sorrell wore out day after day after day over on the steam hammer. And uh, uh, the die sinking department were highly skilled. Sometimes they're called pattern makers. And I was fortunate enough to work in this department most of my career. And these guys were super skilled and uh, really helped develop the, uh, the forging business here in Newcastle, Indiana. They were really big, heavy-duty commercial blacksmiths is what they were. Well, actually, Bill was the blacksmith. We made the, we made the dies and he bent them up. Yeah. So that's a little bit of history about the die sinking department. Well, you got to have gears because change just didn't get it. With the roads being gravel and mud and all that, they would eventually rust and break or bind up. So they designed what they call the ring and pinion 
that they closed the dry shaft to keep all the mud and all the crud out of the gears, and they had to make the ring and pinion gears. Well, this was a big, big deal at the quantities that needed to build 20,000 cars a year. And these guys were top notch. Uh, I don't think they were there when we left, but there was gear cutters down in department 84 with a machine called the Hobbs. And it made the steering boxes uh, for the manual steering for many, many years down there. But these guys were highly skilled likewise. And here's a picture of the third floor, the final assembly. Uh, now the assembly here was a mass assembly, but it was different. The car did not move. In most assembly line, if you get on the internet and watch the modern ones, a guy stands here and the car comes by or the truck comes by like this. Well, what they did was the car was here and they just, people moved, but it made a mass production and they didn't have to slow down. So that was the first um, and is credited to Ransom E. Oles and Jonathan Maxwell that came up with the first assembly line, but Henry Ford got credit for it, but Ransom E. Oles and Jonathan Maxwell first perfected the assembly line. And here's another picture. You see the frame doesn't move and the people did. And by the time the people got over here on the far right side, it was an assembled car and they drove it off. Maxwell made some trucks, but didn't make a lot of them. Uh, they used them obviously here in Newcastle to chase parts and things like that. And we're very fortunate that uh, the family of Henry Edwards donated this photo to the Henry County Historical Society in their little two cylinder. And um, for those of you that want to go down and look at the Maxwell, that runs, by the way, and I have driven it on several occasions in parades and stuff. And they always ask me, how fast will it go? And I say, wide open, downhill with a tailwind about 10 miles an hour. <laughs> and uphill's not much better. No, but it's fun to drive. It shakes, it rattles, it vibrates, and um, it's hand cranked. I know Mitch and I have had our turn cranking that thing. and We've decided it's for a younger man to do that in the future. So, and I'll also explain that we also had a very nice man donate us a beautiful 1930 Chrysler with electric starter, so we drive it in the parades now. But the, the Maxwell we have is a runnable, drivable car. I mentioned about the Ford shop. This was one of the earliest Forge before they built the factory, and I'll get to that here in a minute. These were called board hammers. In the central, they made boards bolted the dies to that, then they had a flywheel, and then they had a trip, and it would drop. Uh, Bill, you remember the board hammers over in the heat treat. That was the actual first forge plant before they built the big building. And, uh, and that was a dangerous place. I know uh, there, there were a lot of guys that Charlie and Bill and I knew that didn't leave there with all their fingers and toes. Amen. Yep. Uh, it was a hot, it was dangerous, but boy, was it exciting to walk down that hammer shop when all those hammers were swinging, especially when they were made uh, Ed Zachary and, and um, Fletcher and those guys were making uh, the big axle dies. That was a sight to see. It's, ex it's just impossible to describe that. But for those of us like Bill and Charlie, Mitch, to have seen that, uh, uh, Bill, you want to try to describe that? Which one, run the hammer? Yeah. I mean, what the noise and the heat and the. And then we had that one called zero. Remember that one? Yes. We, had, we had 23 hammers and zero. So we had 24, actually. <laughs> yeah, one always made the rods, didn't it? They usually made rods in 12. 12, okay. All right. So there, uh, just kind of, if you will, remember that picture there because things are going to change <laughs> big time here very soon. Maxwell had a great presence in the, the city itself. They had a gymnasium, they had basketball, and they had a lot of sports, which we'll get into that here very soon. 
and uh, they were very successful. And uh, I know from the guys that I was, when I hired in in the 60s at the Chrysler, the guys that were retiring, one of the ways you got on at the Chrysler was to be a good athlete. You were a good baseball player. You were a good football player. And especially if you were a good pitcher, you had a lifetime job with Maxwell. It was, it was exciting, uh, and they were good, and you're going to see that here in a little bit too. Not only were they good in sports and dedicated, they had a heck of a band. Here on the left, you'll see Joe Newby in a new Maxwell with the Maxwell Band in 1908. And uh, Joe Newby was one of the first automobile dealers. I believe he was the first automobile dealer here in Newcastle, and I believe he had an Oldsmobile dealership at that time. But he had all kinds of them by the time he, uh, he left the business. And his family was in the automobile business here in Newcastle until about 1980, Newby Paul Motor Company. At right is the Maxwell Band ready to perform at the Indianapolis 500 on 1911. That's the very first Indianapolis 500, and they were so well recognized, they were asked to come and march down the front stretch as many bands do today. Eddie Rickenbacker at that time was a fairly unknown race car driver and probably not very well known in the whole world. But Eddie Rickenbacker drove Maxwell's at the Indianapolis 500, as you can see here. He was also in the Indianapolis 500 in 1915, and he drove in six Indy 500s. One year after this picture, he led the Presolite team to seven victories in 13 events, although not at the Indianapolis 500 all over the United States. He went on to become a World War I aviation ace, downing more enemy aircraft, 26, than anyone else. At that time, he became uh, pretty much a dinner table name recognized all over the world. But one of the things that uh, Eddie Rickenbacker is probably not known to too many people, auto historians probably would be, that he bought shortly thereafter, he bought the Indianapolis Speedway from the original owners and builders and carried the Indianapolis 500 on through up to the Second World War. The, ta uh, the track then went into kind of disrepair and almost went away, but he negotiated a deal with Tony Holman and sold the Indianapolis 500 track to Tony Holman, and everybody pretty much knows the history from 1946 to today of the Holman family until Roger Penske bought the track. The Maxwell had a semi-pro baseball team that was a pretty good baseball team, and one of the ways you got hired in at the Maxwell. As you can see here, the Maxwell baseball diamond is located besides the factory, it opened June the 2nd, 1909, before a crowd of 1,800 people. On September the 27th, 1919, a Maxwell baseball team defeated the Major League Pittsburgh Pirates 7-6 in Newcastle. The 1919 Pittsburgh Pirates were no pushovers. They finished the Major League season that year with a 71-68 record, fourth in the eight-team league. The Maxwell team proved it was no fluke a few days later, defeating Pittsburgh again 7-3 in a game played at Anderson. And if you're wondering, just where was that ball diamond located? Well, for the locals that live here in Henry County, right across the street from where the Chrysler and the Maxwell plant was is the big water tower today. So if you can remember where the water tower was, if you look straight south, that is where that ball diamond was located, just about at the corner or between South 21st and 22nd Streets on I Avenue. Hard hats forever. And then one day they came out and said, you don't have to wear your hard hat anymore. That was, what, in the late 90s, Bill? Somewhere in there. Yeah. I mean, they would threaten to fire people and write them up if uh, you didn't wear your hard hat. And then one day, oh, you don't have to wear it. So all the bandanas, uh, safety glasses were probably saved some people's eyes. There's no doubt about that. And the gloves were very good, and the leather aprons were so hot in the summertime. They were provided, but most guys didn't wear them. Now, this is the original hammer shop. You'll see it's driven by belts up in the ceiling. A lot of the early machinery there were belt-driven. They didn't have the electrical motors and, uh, for each uh, piece of machinery like they did in my lifetime. And those belts would come off and smack people upside the head, but that wasn't a big deal. But it was, it was common for those belts to come off. 
All right. They decided since everything was going so well, we need to build us a huge, world-famous Maxwell hammer shop. This was the beginning of the construction in 1916, right there across from the water tower. This is going to be the new most modern and largest steam hammer shop in the world, at which it was at that time. Now, this is where I was mentioning to Bill a little bit ago for those that got to walk down through that aisle with all those hammers swinging. Uh, loud, hot, uh, dangerous, but fascinating to watch those guys make the big truck axles, connecting rods, steering arms, whatever. Um, I said, you can't even come close to words to describe when this thing was running full bore. Uh, I remember some of the old timers that were retiring when I hired in would tell me that they lived up the street a few blocks, that when it was quiet at night, you knew something had happened at the Maxwell or the Chrysler. And I know there were some uh, supervisors back then that were so good that lived within a couple of miles of the plant. And if somebody's keys were loose on their dies and had that sound, they'd get up, come in there, and want to know why those keys aren't tied in that hammer. That's how good some of these guys were. Unfortunately, the Ford shop stood until 1998. And let's uh, see, yeah. This was a sad day for me. I worked in that building, Bill worked in that building, many other people. This is when they blew it down. Uh, it was 1998. I was fortunate enough to be there to see it and take this picture, but uh, there was a lump in my throat when I saw that drop because I knew what it meant for the employment of the Newcastle plant. Okay, here you get a real idea for those of you that know about where the plant was located and there you can see the, the new hammer shop and the ball diamond is still there. Um, that's where they put the crane track in and the railroad track in later on to supply all the steel for the, uh, the brand new hammer shop. So that was, uh, that was quite an undertaking and it had to be exciting back then, all this industry that in 1917, like 20 years before that, there was a horse and buggy and people were farming and nobody got really excited about anything. Then all of a sudden, here's all this industry and here this inner urban is and automobiles running up and down the street that uh, if I was a senior in high school in 1917, that had to be an exciting time and to grow up and watch all of that. They also had a football team. Uh, you can see they already were going into marketing by all the signs in the background. Somebody figured that out a long, long time ago. This picture was taken at Harvey's Park where, where the Eagles Lodge is out there on the other side of Blue River where they're building the new bridge. Um, and unfortunately, if you read the names, Bergner Chicago Store, Cliff and Haynes House of Good Shoes, Coffin Jewelry, Conheller, all of those are long gone. The only one that I can think of that I still remember in my lifetime was the Coffin Jewelry Store. It was right behind Denton's Drug Store uh, there on Broad Street between Main and uh, 14th Street. And uh, uh, that's too bad. Now the Maxwell runs, like I say, the Maxwell was dependable. And to prove they were dependable, they had a lot of Maxwells come and put on a run that drove around the area, Connersville, Muncie, Anderson. Uh, I think they went to Greenfield and uh, to see how dependable the cars were. Well, the Maxwells won it and uh, had very few breakdowns and I think almost all the cars finished. So on the 100th anniversary of the Maxwell car, now not the factory here in Newcastle, a bunch of the old Maxwell owners decided they would do a reenactment of that. And I was part of that committee and I will say I never had so much fun. I had just retired and uh, had a lot of time on my hands and um, 
we, uh, we had 70 cars. Uh, we wanted 100, but we didn't quite get that many. And you'll see here, here is the reenactment in 2004. Uh, a local photographer named Dave Nance took this photograph from the top of the uh, building there across the street. Uh, these cars were shook, rattled, and went on. And I think, as I remember, there were one car uh, where the grease seal on the rear end went out, and I think that was the only car that didn't finish the reenactment of the Maxwell run. We went out through every back country road you could think of, and uh, we actually took them out to Mount Lawn Speedway, which is just west of town, and they made laps out there and got the checkered flag, got their picture taken, and uh, I think that was like four or five days, as I remember, Tuesday through Saturday, and uh, they come from all over the United States. I think a couple of Canadians came down. I know I got to meet a guy from California that uh, towed two of his in, and uh, we just had a good time, just real good time. It was a lot of fun. Here's the Maxwell Centennial, which we have some of those here. And we also have one of the, they had aprons that every car got. And we got one here that's down in the Maxwell room. They were very rare at that time. To, so we got one because we were the host. The museum was the host. There you see a newspaper front page, 100 years Maxwell time capsule. The time capsule. We opened it and um, had a big celebration. It rained that day. And uh, we were a little bit disappointed that uh, we've got everything that was in the time capsule here. And it, it wasn't very much in it. We thought since it was a big deal, your vice president's here. Uh, it was in a solid copper box. It was fabricated by the tinsmiths there in the plant. And we thought there'd be a lot of memorabilia. Well, they did put a couple of newspapers in there, but the time we opened it up and tried to get them out, they just crumbled and you know, it was just not very nice. But uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to be on that committee and be there and, and took a lot of video. I think Mitch was there. You took a lot of pictures that day too. Joe Newby. As I explained earlier, his first, the first automobile agent, where are we out on time? Uh, we're at uh, just over 40 minutes. Okay. In 1912, uh, the building behind him is still standing. It's on Broad Street. And it was the, uh, the Chevrolet dealership for many, many years after he passed on. And then it was the cable TV building. And it's right across the street from, uh, geez, in, in today's world, what's it right across the street from the... Uh, yeah, it's kind of in a block of its own now because the buildings on both sides of it have been torn down, but it's between 11th and 12th Street on the south side, but the building is still standing. Uh, you can see there's a garage door there, but that's all been boarded up, and, but the building is still there. And talking about Maxwell and the community involvement, Maxwell didn't get a lot of credit for because the Chrysler overshadowed him so much later in years, but initially... There was a little girl from Newcastle that disappeared. And uh, I wish that we, we thought about trying to show the, the video, but it just didn't work out uh, with the uh, PowerPoint. But this little girl mysteriously disappeared. She was nine years old. She disappeared from plain sight right up on Broad Street, which is a very busy place. And the girl just vanished. So in this video, had we been able to show it, uh, Maxwell shut down the plant and let every employee go out and comb the countryside for the little girl. And uh, the video showed um, um, the employees pouring out the door and riding their bicycles and um, uh, looking for the little girl. But unfortunately, uh, she was never found and uh, the case was never solved. But boy, are there a lot of people in Newcastle would like to tell you their version of what happened to her. It's, a, it's kind of a big deal. We've had several Catherine Winters uh, programs up here, and that was probably some of the most successful we've had up here. And to this day, if you want to put a note that uh, there's some people got new leads on the Catherine Winters and will be at Stack's Restaurant at 7 o'clock tonight, you better get there early because there's going to be a lot of people there wanting to share their ideas where Catherine Winters is. 
Maxwell, one of the things about the quality of their automobile is every one of them was driven before it was uh, loaded on uh, railroad cars because they didn't have transport cars, so everything was shipped via railroad. And right behind the plant, uh, which would be about where M Avenue dead ends on 18th Street, is where this track was. Initially, this was identified as the Maxwell Racetrack, but that was not true. It's the Maxwell Test Track, and their racetrack was the one, as I mentioned earlier, out at 31st and Brown Road. But they had their own test track, and every car was driven and driven up on the railroad car, and that meant it was ready to ship. Maxwells were everywhere because they were dependable. For a time, Maxwell was considered one of the top three automobile firms in America, along with General Motors and Ford, though the phrase, the big three, was not used at that time. By 1914, the company had sold 60,000 cars, but Benjamin Briscoe had even bigger ideas, plans that unfortunately sent the company into financial chaos. What he wanted to do, he wanted to split off and make his own version of General Motors and consolidate five automobile brands at once, which Maxwell would be the lead one, Stoddard Dayton, The Brush, and uh, American National, I can't remember the other one, and it was called the United States Motor Company, USMC, which the Marine Corps probably didn't like, but it was USMC. And it, uh, it pretty much fizzled real quick, which eventually bankrupted uh, Maxwell, and here's the um, one of the interesting things about Maxwell and Briscoe and the name on the automobile. By 1912, Jonathan Maxwell had left the company. Although it was still called the Maxwell Automobile Company, Maxwell left in 1912. Briscoe quit in 1913, and he was no longer in the company. A guy by the name of Walter Flanders took it over and survived World War I, but um, it, it just didn't happen. There was a huge depression that not many people know about in 1917, right after World War I, that everybody seems to know about the one of 29, but in 17 there was one as bad per capita back then. And uh, Flanders carried it through pretty good. He got some financing and kept the Maxwell brand going after they dissolved the USMC and Maxwell became an entity of its own. Now here is a, a great story. This lady was named Alice Ramsey. And back in 1909, it was not fashionable or ladylike to drive an automobile. But she, among many other ladies, has said a horse hockey to that, she contacted Maxwell and said, I'd like to have one of your cars and drive it from New York City to San Francisco. And they said, are you out of your mind? And she said, nope, when do I get my car? And they gave her two cars. And her and three of her lady friends drove that car. I think it took 41 days to drive from uh, New York to San Francisco, but they completed the run and you'll see in the background, there's another Maxwell with technicians and repairmen. It did not go flawlessly, but she completed the run and she was very famous for it. Alice Ramsey, if you want to get real interesting story, why well, look it up on the internet, Alice Ramsey and the Maxwell Cross Country Tour. It's a very uh, exciting story. And um, if I started elaborating on that one, some of the stops and some of the funny stories, we'd be here till Tuesday of next week. So. I promised I'd keep this to an hour, so we're going to try to make that. So uh, uh, before I go on, let me see. Yes, we already covered the USMC. Um, before I go on, yeah. Now's the time I think we need to talk about the Spalding Cup. This is a fantastic piece of history. Um, Tony, can you give us any other information other than what you shared with us? No, sir. Um, would you mind if I... Sitting in the house with plastic flowers in it. But um, the inscription reads, the Spalding Trophy presented to Maxwell Champions Indiana State League season 1912. Uh, this 
is a huge donation for us. And by coincidence, on the night we're doing this presentation, how timely. Thank you so much, Tony. That is yeah, awesome. Awesome. And please don't leave without we get a picture with you and the trophy. The one that matches your one out the post office. We can Photoshop that. Okay. Then came World War I. Uh, the Chrysler plant here in town, which most people, locals know, was credited uh, during World War II as providing millions of bullets, gun parts, tank parts, and they, uh, they really did a big job during World War II. Unfortunately, Maxwell was overlooked in what they did during World War I. And uh, I did some digging and found out about that. And uh, here you see the Maxwell plant in Newcastle produced hundreds of thousands of shells in World War I. So if you would please remember that. The Bundy forces captured this 20,000 pound German Krupp cannon that now sits in our local Henry County Memorial Park. It was refurbished in 2019 by a team of volunteers. Not only did the Maxwell in World War I uh, supply ammunition, but uh, uh, their, their facility because of the forge plant helped win World War I. Now, not only was buying Liberty Bonds in World War II a big deal, 1916 and 17, Maxwell was doing it way back then. You can see how many names are on that. And if you'll notice at the top, it says the fourth loan. So that's the fourth billboard. Look at the names on there. And it says, we shipped the hell out of them. So uh, Maxwell was a really a big, big, big deal in many ways here in Newcastle. Then came hard times. Explained earlier about the USMC. And they, uh, they couldn't recover from the depression like they can today. And uh, by the early 20s, Maxwell was in trouble. But it was still a good automobile. And at that time, a guy by the name of Walter P. Chrysler was making his own name with Buick. And he didn't like the way that Bill Durant was running General Motors. And he got, uh, pretty much got fired, kind of like Lee Iacocca did with Henry Ford. So there was, a, there was a definite pattern there. So 1924, uh, the Maxwell was just about ready to go under. In walks Walter P. Chrysler. He founded the company in 1925. It was still called the Maxwell Motor Car Company, and it was reorganized into the Chrysler Corporation in 25. He was initially hired to take over and overhaul Maxwell Motor Company in the early 20s. Chrysler's impact was immediate on the automobile and the mar automotive market and industry as a whole. As for Newcastle and Henry County, Chrysler's impact can still be felt today. Nearly a century later, even though the plant has been gone for some time now, of the big building, we were fortunate enough that uh, Chrysler Corporation and Metaldine allowed uh, the local community with pressure from us at the museum to leave us the cornerstone and as a monument to all the things that went on there for 96 years. Here's our 1911 Maxwell. It's on display downstairs. We actually built its own little building uh, about uh, eight years ago. We started that, uh, that project, which I was part of. And um, it, it's just been a, a real, real exciting room for us. Then we got the Chrysler. And uh, for those of you that want to go down and see it, we'll make that available tonight. So now I'd like to go into the Q&A. Questions, comments? Yes, did I hear? Um, how many are left? Do you have any ideas? How many? How many Maxwells are left? I think I saw in uh, some of the, uh, there's uh, like 750 Maxwells that are on the Maxwell register. Now that doesn't mean there's some sitting in a barn partially, uh, but if you are registered in the Maxwell Club, there's a little 
750. And we had 90, 91, 92 here for that reenactment in 2004. Yeah, that was a big deal here in Henry County. Questions? Comments? Okay, we'll wrap it up here. But before I do, I have to thank some of the people that helped me do this presentation a week ago at the uh, library and again tonight. Daryl Radford, uh, he put the PowerPoint together for me. I just supplied him with ideas, comments, and he made it pretty. Uh, Doug Majors and the late Mike Bertram for some of the photographs. Don Davis, a Newcastle retiree, and helped us at the library set this thing up. And the Henry County Historical Society for providing the building and the funds to keep the Maxwell running and the Chrysler running and uh, allow all of us to come in here free of charge and attend presentations like this. Once again, I have to mention Brad Burke back there with the camera. He keeps all this together for us. And uh, Mitch, Kathy Rogers, a board member, Vicki Graham, a board member, and uh, of course, Daryl and Kay. And uh, I thank every one of you for coming tonight. It's been my pleasure to be able to present this to you. So thank you.